Good evening. I'm Alfred Hitchcock. You've come on a slow night. Only five murders. Known as the Master of Suspense, Alfred Hitchcock had been directing classic movies for years, but on the side, had been selecting short stories and writing introductions for several suspenseful anthology books. And he had been interested in doing his own radio show. However, it was his agent, Lou Wasserman, who was also the head of MCA, who had the idea for an Alfred Hitchcock anthology TV series. Hitchcock would produce it, direct a certain number of episodes, and be the host, which would show off his unique personality and flair for poking fun at himself. In return, he would be paid $125,000 per episode, and after the initial broadcast, the rights to the show would revert back to him. He always preferred working with proven material, so producers Joan Harrison and Norman Lloyd would select and submit summaries of short stories or stories that had been done on radio. Hitchcock would approve them, address any problems, which was rare, and occasionally come up with an even better twist ending than the story already had. The show ran for seven seasons, doing 268 half-hour episodes. Hitchcock directed 17 and became an even bigger celebrity than he was before. And after that, they did three more seasons as an hour show. But here are the top 10 half-hour episodes. Because the twist ending is such an important part in what makes a great episode, I have to discuss it, so I'm giving you a spoiler warning now. But if your husband or wife is planning on killing you, and you don't have time to watch the actual episode, congratulations, this is the perfect video for you. Number 10, and so died Rhea Pachinska. Based on a short story by Ray Bradbury, this episode stars Claude Rains as Fabian, a ventriloquist who's in love with his dummy. I love how dark this story is. Growing up in the 90s, I always associated creepy dummy stories with like Slappy where the dummy is alive. But this is Alfred Hitchcock Presents, where it's more realistic, which I think makes it creepier because this dummy is not alive, except to Fabian. He's designed her appearance, her personality, and has given her a voice. She always tells the truth, which is a very pure quality. This is his ideal woman. And to him, she is so alive that he'll have her talk even when it's against his best interest. And he has even made her in love with him. He spent hundreds of dollars on her wardrobe when his wife had nothing to wear, and has even killed a man who threatened to expose him. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Oripachinska, have you anything to say to your audience? I think you are wonderful. Have you anything to say to me? I think you are the most wonderful ventriloquist in the world, and... And what? I love you, Fabian. What are you thinking about, Mr. Fabian? About you, as always. Claude Rains was one of the best character actors from the golden age of Hollywood, and he had been in Alfred Hitchcock's Notorious, and he plays it so sincerely and so tenderly that you sympathize with him and are on his side, despite how twisted the situation is. Number 9, Breakdown. This episode is based on a short story by Lewis Pollock. It had been featured in Alfred Hitchcock's A Baker's Dozen of Suspense Stories, and it had been dramatized on radio with Joseph Cotton. Here, Cotton reprises his role of a producer who has just fired a longtime employee on the telephone, and is mad that the guy broke down and cried. While Joseph Cotton is driving home, he has a car accident and is paralyzed. He can't even blink. And everyone, including the morgue attendants, a 
assume he's dead. If this was like a mother and her child, I think this episode would be too emotionally draining. But this guy's a jerk. And it works like a Christmas carol, where you slowly but surely get on Ebenezer Scrooge's side as you discover his humanity. Because even after he's paralyzed and when people steal from his car, he still acts like a fool of himself boss. What are they doing? Why aren't they moving me? They didn't come here to help. They just came here to loot, to strip the car. I've had about enough of this. Is there nobody around here but criminals and ghouls? Somebody will hear about this. I promise that. It isn't until the end, when the morgue attendants think he's dead, that he finally loses his ego. He emotionally breaks down, and the tear comes out. And that's when the morgue attendants discover he's alive. So it's the thing that he resented about humanity is what saves him. Hitchcock directed this one, and he loved the challenge of being visually creative in a constraining circumstance. Like in his movie Lifeboat, where it all takes place on one set, but every shot is different. And here, his protagonist does not move and only speaks in voiceover. But the way he uses close-ups and different camera angles, it's still visually interesting. And you can still see the desperation of the character. Number 8. The West Warlock Time Capsule Henry Jones plays George, a taxidermist, who's working on a stuffed horse that will contain the town's time capsule. George's brother-in-law, Waldron, comes for a visit. A very long visit. George's wife actually passes out from waiting on Waldron hand and foot. So George kills him and puts him inside the stuffed horse. Alfred Hitchcock's opening and closings always had dark humor, but this is a really funny dark humor episode. Now, no offense if this is your profession, because I know it takes a lot of talent. But come on, Norman Bates did taxidermy. It's kind of weird. So it gives this episode a unique flavor, and they're able to get a lot of jokes about it. Tonight is a tale of a timid taxidermist, which gives me the excuse to exhibit this prize of mine, and to discuss taxidermy. I feel I know quite a bit about stuffed animals. After all, it takes one to know one. Waldron is such an annoying character. He's lazy, he's a mooch. And when George is hot and opens the window, Waldron complains about the draft. And because this is Alfred Hitchcock Presents, you kind of know that George is going to kill him. And you're on his side and can't wait. And by him putting Waldron's body inside the stuffed horse, it makes the perfect punchline, because now Waldron is figuratively and literally a horse's ass. Episode number seven is The Glass Eye. Based on a short story by John Keir Cross and starring Jessica Tandy, Julia is a lonely woman. No spouse, not close to her family, and it doesn't seem like she has any friends. But she falls in love while watching the ventriloquist Max Collodi on stage. She follows him from town to town, is infatuated with him. But when she finally meets him, she discovers that the man is the dummy. And the dummy is a little person with a mask. I think this is one of the spookiest twist endings of the entire series because it's well set up where it makes sense, but still comes as a terrifying surprise. The story opens with William Shatner, telling us about this glass eye that his aunt had kept in her possession for years and years. So we know it's important, and that is something that a dummy would have. Plus, most of the shots of the ventriloquist and dummy are from a distance, so it's hard to get a good look at them. And the actor, Tom Conway, stays very stiff to suggest that he's a dummy. But what makes you not notice is Jessica Tandy as Julia. She comes across as such a lonely and kind woman. But she's so happy with being in love with Max Collodi that you want it to work out for her. Max Collodi allows Julia to meet him, but it must be in a dark room and only for 15 minutes. But Julia is so excited 
but when she touches him, he falls, and his head comes off in her arms, and then the dummy gets up. Your devotion touches me more deeply than anything in my whole life. It is I who am grateful to you, dear lady. My life, I regret to say, has been an unbelievably lonely one. Oh, Mr. Colodi, I don't know how to say this, but ever since I first saw you, I've had the greatest urge to touch you. Madame. Oh, Max! Get out! Get out of here! Get out of here! Get out! With the dark lighting and that creepy mask that was just kind of made by the prop department, it is so scary for us and for them because she gives up on love and he quits ventriloquism and changes his name because their one chance at escaping loneliness dramatically blew up in their faces. Number six, one more mile to go. Sam Jacoby is arguing with his wife, so he kills her and puts her body in the trunk of his car to be disposed of. But then he gets pulled over because his tail light is out, and the policemen insist that he get it fixed now. But at the gas station, the new bulb won't work because of the excess weight in the trunk pressing against it. Alfred Hitchcock directed this episode too, and with the car setting and the tense atmosphere, it's like a predecessor of the scenes of Marion Crane stealing the money and getting stopped by the police in Psycho. As he would sometimes do in his movies, he doesn't let us hear what the fight is about, so we're unable to judge, and our sympathy is with Sam, and the suspense comes from that universal fear of the police. And will this taillight come on? Well, you've got a defective wire. What do you got in the trunk? It seems to be loaded down. Just some tools I forgot to take out at the house. They're kind of heavy. That's what did it. Where's the key? We could open the trunk and Red could take a look at it. The key? I must have forgot the key to the trunk at home. Well, this light's got to be fixed. This could cause an accident. You know, sometimes you can spring open the trunk on these old cars. No! I mean, can't you just give me a ticket and get it over with? Sure, I could give you a ticket. But that still wouldn't fix this taillight, now would it? I asked you a question, now would it? Now, there's been a lot of accidents on this highway lately, and this could cause another one. When Alfred Hitchcock was a little boy. I know that's hard to imagine. He had done something wrong, like normal little boy stuff. And his father sent him to the police station with a note. And the policeman locked him in the cell for five minutes and told him, that's what we do to naughty boys. And ever since then, Alfred Hitchcock was terrified of the police. Now, even when I don't have a dead body in my trunk, I'm afraid of being pulled over. I think most of us are. So all of us, the character, the actor David Wayne, the director, and the audience are all bringing this fear to the table. And that's why it feels so tense and suspenseful. The policeman is insistent on doing his job, but he's not a bad guy. So the fate of this man all rests on this simple everyday taillight. And your eyes are just fixated on, on it. Will it go on? Will it go on? Will it go on? That's why they call him the master of suspense. Number five, specialty of the house. Based on Stanley Illin's short story, at the exclusive club named Spiro's, the specialty of the house, Lamb Armistan, is only served occasionally, but it's delicious and they all love it. But as Mr. Laffler finds out, it's made with human flesh. Mmm. Because cannibalism stories have been done on Tales from the Crypt and other horror shows, Right away you think, is this a cannibalism story? But then you go, this is Alfred Hitchcock Presents, they're not going to do that. But then they do. And it's classy, eerie, and filled with dark humor. The way this swanky club seems to work is there are 39 permanent members, and then always one or two people trying to become permanent members. And that's who they eat. And on the wall, they have the pictures of all their victims, and you'll notice they're all overweight. 
Lamb Amistad. Do not him, me first, me first. No, no. Sorry, sir. No rules. <laughs> I love the anticipation in all their faces over the Lamb Armistan, especially how excited Mr. Laffler is for it. It's so funny, but also very creepy. And I think it works as a metaphor for the wealthy in our society. It reminds me of Jonathan Swift's an immodest proposal in that way. They don't care about the human sacrifice as long as they get their pleasurable eating experience. The opening and closing are especially fun here too. James Allardyce always wrote them, and he made Hitchcock into an Adams Family type figure. And Hitchcock, who loved doing these, delivers it with such dignity that it's irresistible. Here, he pretends to be on a picnic where he has two salt shakers, one with sand and another with ants. And at the end, he's attacked by a giant ant. Number four, Bing, you're dead. Danger, Will Robinson, danger! Bill Moomy plays little Jackie Chester, who, like a lot of little boys in the 50s, loves playing cowboy. His uncle, who just got back from Africa, told Jackie that he has a surprise for him. And while helping his uncle unpack, Jackie finds a gun. He assumes it's a toy and it's his surprise and loads it what what he thinks are fake bullets, and then walks to the grocery store. Bill Moomy was one of the best and most prolific child actors from this era. And on screen, I don't mean this to be mean, but he's not overly cute, he's smart, and has a slight bratty quality, like a normal kid. And that's what makes this episode so tense. Because he's playing with it and pretending to shoot people, like a real kid in this era who loved cowboys would. Now earlier in the episode, he didn't fill all the chambers. So every time he's just playing and is about to shoot someone, you are on edge thinking, is that the one with the bullet? Is he gonna kill someone? It is so suspenseful. This is a more serious and socially conscious episode about children having access to their parents' guns. And in the intro and closing, Hitchcock treats it more seriously too, and I have great respect for that. But to give it some levity, he still makes fun of his sponsor. After an experience like that, we need something to break the spell, and I have just the thing. I shall rejoin you in a moment. <coughs> Headache pounding like a drum, don't let it last and last. Get quick relief from Bufferin, it's fast, fast, fast! Hitchcock making a joke out of his sponsor was one of the show's signatures, and it's still a really unique aspect of the humor. As you may have guessed, Alfred Hitchcock directed this one too, but Bill Moomy did not have a great experience working with him. Now when you light a shot, you're supposed to have a stand in there to see how the light looks on the person. Now with child labor laws, you're only allowed to have child actors on the set for a certain number of hours, and that time was getting close. And somehow it was faster to just have Bill Moomy stand there than to bring in the stand-in. And it takes a while. He was seven years old and he got, you know, fidgety. Then Alfred Hitchcock got out of his chair, dripping with sweat, and whispered, If you don't stop moving about, I'm going to nail your feet to the floor, and the blood will come pouring out like milk. So stop moving. When Billy told his mother, she said, Oh honey, he's British, they have a different sense of humor. <coughs> Excuse me, number three is the dusty drawer. Dick York plays Norman Lloyd, who believes that the banker William Tritt shorted him $200 last year. He discovers a hidden drawer in the desk of the bank, and then holds up Tritt with a toy gun and hides it in the dusty drawer. 
so that when Trick tells the others about it, they'll all think he's crazy. I think Dick York is one of the greatest television actors from this era. He was so funny on Bewitched, he was terrific on Twilight Zone, and this is one of my favorite Dick York performances. On the outside, he acts so calm and unassuming, but you just know that on the inside, that this guy is crazy. And his facial expressions when trying to look innocent are hilarious. However, when it's just him and Twiddle, you can see the change in his eyes. He really is threatening, and you don't know what he's capable of and how far he will go. Now really, Mr. Pinkston, if I had robbed your bank, do you suppose I'd be standing out here in front of it like an idiot? Mr. Logan, do you mind if we search you? No, no indeed. Please, please, not in the street! I insist. But it's practically zero! It's not a question of temperature, Mr. Pinkson, it's a question of honor. It's a more lighthearted episode, but it's still very much an Alfred Hitchcock Presents story, because it's all about big revenge. But instead of murder, the goal is to get the person committed to a mental institution so that you could get your 200 bucks back. And the way the two main characters are, with Norman being crazy and Trick wanting to move up and being afraid to make a mistake, you're not really sure which one is in the right. I also love how it's a dark humor story set at Christmas time. And with the bank setting, it sort of reminds me of Gremlins. There's old fashioned Christmas trees in the background. Norman is humming Christmas songs to annoy Crit. And in the final scene, Norman finds out that Crit has been fired from the bank. We hear the Deck the Halls music, and Norman has gotten what he wants for Christmas. And we get one final Dick York funny face. Number two, Man from the South. Based on a story by Raoul Dahl and starring Steve McQueen and Peter Lorre, Steve McQueen is bragging about how his Zippo lighter never misses. So Peter Lorre makes him a bet. If McQueen can light the lighter ten times in succession, he'll get Peter Lorre's convertible. If Steve McQueen loses, Peter Lorre will get his pinky. This is a cool episode with a ghoulish twist. Steve McQueen's nickname was the King of Cool. And the plot involves cigarettes, which I know are bad for you but look awesome in black and white, a convertible, and gambling. The intro has Alfred Hitchcock at the horse races, and the story itself is set in Las Vegas. Steve McQueen is a confident guy who paid 99 cents for a lighter, which is $8.71 today, and he believes in it. He stays calm with that Steve McQueen coolness, but on the inside, you could tell he's nervous. He's going to have his pinky chopped off, so you could admire him, but he's also relatable. Then there's horror icon Peter Lorre, who first comes off as a big shot, but is really like a creepy big kid. And you can tell by the way he holds the axe how disappointed he is when the lighter lights. It's so funny. The final thing I love is the twist ending, where Peter Lorre's wife comes in and stops the game. Carlos, why would you do this again? I am so sorry that this happened again. He's a menace, of course. In the islands where we used to live, he took 47 fingers from different people and lost 11 cars. Now he has no car. The car is mine. That's what makes it so contemptible. He had nothing in the world to bet with, I assure you. Because I managed to win it all. It took a very long time, and it was very hard work. But I won it all in the end. In Hitchcock's movie Sabotage, there's this scene where there's a bomb on the bus, and you're wondering, will it explode and it's real suspenseful? And then it goes off, and Hitchcock always felt that was a mistake. He thought that audiences needed relief after a big suspenseful moment, and you get that relief when the game is called off. But part of you still wants to see Steve McQueen's fingers chopped off, so with the wife, you get a surprise but you still get that ghoulish thrill you've been waiting for. 
Alma and I will be getting euros tonight. Number one is lamb for the slaughter. Based on a story by Raoul Dahl, Lieutenant Jack Noonan has just told his pregnant wife that he's leaving her to go off with another woman. His wife Mary is beside herself and kills him by hitting him on the head with a leg of lamb. Before calling the police, who all know her husband and what he's like, she makes the house look like there's been a struggle. And while the police are trying to figure out what the murder weapon was, she serves them the leg of lamb. This is the grooviest murder weapon ever, a leg of lamb. Colonel Mustard has nothing on this. It's partly ridiculous. It fits Hitchcock because he loved food. And it fits the character Mary Newton. She is the perfect 1950s homemaker. She keeps the house clean. She cooks her husband dinner. But this time he has gone too far. And she turns his own dinner against him. And it creates the funniest twist ending where the police are still racking their brains trying to figure out the murder weapon while they're eating it. Now, society in the 1950s made Mary Noonan a housewife and made her dependent on her husband. But she plays it against them and uses those very skills to outsmart the police, get away with murder, and guess what? Her husband isn't going with the other woman after all. Barbara Bel Geddes plays Mary, and I love her performance. She comes across as such a sweetheart and is really hurt and doesn't know what to do when her husband is leaving her, so you have so much sympathy for her. But then, she seems to be having so much fun when she kills him and when she messes up the house on purpose to make it look like a struggle. And it's a ball to watch her. And the last time you see her is when the police are eating the lamb and she's just giggling in front of the camera. Alfred Hitchcock's intro and closing are perfect too. He's gotten a speed eating ticket in a grocery store, which fits the food theme, but also fits the Hitchcock theme of fear of the police. Now for the closing, he'll do this in other episodes too, but this is the best example of it. Television censors demand it, that if a character committed a crime, they had to be punished. And this was Mary's punishment. Well that's the way the old meatball bounces. As for Mary Maloney, she would have gone scot-free as she hadn't tried to do in her second husband the same way. Unfortunately, he was a forgetful type and had forgotten to plug in the freezer. The meat was as soft as jelly. Just like Mary Noonan, with a wink in his eye, Alfred Hitchcock uses 1950s society's own censorship rules against them. Hitchcock directed this episode, and I think you could really tell. There's murder and suspense, but his signature dark sense of humor is felt throughout it. The main character is blonde, and she's about to be a mother, so she's one of Hitchcock's crazy mothers. And I would rank this up there with Psycho, The Birds, or Vertigo is a great piece of Alfred Hitchcock entertainment. I hope you've learned something from watching the top 10 episodes of Alfred Hitchcock Presents. It's easier to kill someone if you plan on eating in. Until next week then, good night.